listeners and viewers throughout the whole world, more particularly to all Shepherd's Rod believers and most especially to our beloved brothers and sisters in the United States of America. A special greetings to our brethren in Colorado, to our brethren in Georgia, in Fiji Island, Mexico, Spain, in Africa to the United Kingdom and our brethren in Australia and to the rest of the 144,000 living saints scattered abroad. Greetings. May the good Lord bless you. This is our episode number four on the subject, the last three who trumpets. Now let us continue our study and to repeat again, the the Bible in Revelation 9 verse 11 was illustrated by the name Abaddon, the Old Testament, and the name Apollyon represent the New Testament according to track number 5, page 70. And on the sixth trumpet, uh, Revelation 11, Verse 5, the Bible is represented by the two olive trees. Whereas on Revelation 6, verse 6, the Bible is represented by oil and wine. The Old Testament represented by oil and the New Testament represented by wine. And the only way by which these three will find its perfect fulfillment. Revelation 9 verse 11, Revelation 11 verse 5, and Revelation 6 verse 6 is in connection with the occurrences in the heavenly sanctuary. We already read that according to track number 5, page 72, such verse in Revelation chapter 9 verse 11 is connected to that parabolical prophecy in Luke 19 verse 14. And we know that the perfect fulfillment of Luke chapter 19 verse 14 is in the time of the purification of the church. Now let us read again uh, the statement on uh, the old symbolic code in 5 symbolic code 6 to 12 page 15 saying no one denies the fact that a number of times in the scriptures Christ is called a man but you surely will not try to make me believe that the man in Luke 19.14 is Christ himself. I care not how spiritually blind you may be. You can still see the literal part of the scripture that at the time those citizens sent the message, Christ was in heaven and the man whom they did not want to reign over them was on earth and that this happened before Christ returned. And on track number 6, on page 55, it says, The scripture make clear that while in the sanctuary, Christ receives the kingdom after the thrones are cast down and after the investigative judgment is completed before his second coming. That this is so is further evidenced by the parable of Luke 19 verse 15 which states that Christ receives the kingdom and that afterwards he comes to slay his enemies. So the shepherd's rod 
is very plain that after Jesus Christ receives the kingdom, he will return to the earth to slay his enemies. Track number 6, page 55. Now, let us connect again answerer number 2. On page 88, it says, bringing into prophetic focus the same event Jesus declared parabolically. A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. Luke 19 verse 12. Note that he receives the kingdom, acquires ownership of it while he is away, not when he returns. Answerer number 2 page 88. So that is very plain that Jesus Christ acquires ownership of that kingdom while Jesus Christ was still in the heavenly sanctuary and not to the time when Jesus Christ returned or not at the time when Jesus Christ arrived to the earth but while Jesus Christ was still on the heavenly sanctuary. Now I would like to connect the statement in the old symbolic code. So it says here, 1 symbolic code number 3 page 4. Christ has further illustrated this incident in the parable of Mark 13 verse 34. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. Without any doubts, Mark 13 verse 34 is the same parabolical prophecy in Luke chapter 19 on verse verse 12. He said, Therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. Luke 19 verse 12. And in Mark 13, 13 verse 34, the statement is, The Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Then it says, After a long time from his ascension, so that is pointing to the ascension of Christ at the end of the 40 days, May 27, 31 AD, Thursday, it says, After a long time from his ascension to the purification of the church. So Luke 19, verse 12 to verse 14, is pointing to the purification of the church. That is the time by which Jesus Christ appoints someone to reign in his stead. Now let us read again in one symbolic code number 3, page 4. After a long time, that is from his ascension to the purification of the church, the Lord of those servants cometh and reconnect with them. Matthew 25 verse 19. Consequently, the period of his absence ends at the purification of the church, at which time he reckons with his servants and himself taketh charge of his flock. But the fact is that Jesus Christ taketh charge of his flock, reigning his people by appointing someone to reign in his stead, according to the Bible as explained by the shepherd's rod. Now, the shepherd's rod declared clearly in track number 8, page 29 and page 30, it says, Also, there are two distinct parables of the talents, First Matthew 25 verse 15 to 30 and Second Luke 19 verse 13 to 27, both of which pointedly enter the picture in its present setting. In the one are three servants, in the other ten servants. This significant difference shows that the former has only a local application, whereas the latter has a worldwide application. Incidentally showing as does the shepherd's rod, volume 2, page 85 and 86, that in the scriptures, number 10 stands for universality and number 3 for the trinity in the church, track number 8, page 29 and page 30. Page 30. 
So the shepherd's rod is plainly telling us that there is a um, significant difference between Matthew 25, the parable in Matthew 25, verse 15 to 30, and Luke 19, from verse 13 to verse 27. To repeat again, there is no record in the parable in Matthew 25 that Jesus Christ used the term mine enemies from verse 13 to verse 30. And the only term used by Jesus Christ according to verse 30, it says, And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So among the three servants, only one called by Jesus Christ as unprofitable servant. But there is no record in Matthew 25 that God had said, Mine enemies. It is only found in Luke chapter 19. Now let us read again on Luke 19 on verse 27. It says, But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. So only in the parable in Luke 19 that God called them mine enemies. Who are they? Those who refuse to receive that man that God have appointed to reign in his stead. And the shepherd's rod remind us that that difference is very significant. Uh, track number 8, page 29 and 30. And the parable in Luke 19 has a worldwide application, whereas the parable in Matthew 25 has only a local application. Worldwide and universal is the same because number 10, according to track number 8, page 29 and 30, indicates universal also worldwide according to the statement or worldwide or universal application. Now, let us ascertain clearly the coming mentioned in Luke 19, but we already established the absolute fact that while Jesus Christ was still in the heavenly sanctuary, he already receives a kingdom. And according to answerer number 2, page 88, acquires ownership of it. Without any doubts, the kingdom mentioned there is the kingdom church or the 11th hour uh, ministry. Now, let us connect the reading on Christ's object lesson, page 68 and page 69. So let us read. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Galatians 5 verse 22 and 23. This fruit can never perish but will produce after its kind a harvest unto eternal life. When the fruit is brought forth, immediately he put it in the sickle because the harvest is come. Now, this statement can only be found in Revelation 14. Now, let's continue reading and then go to Revelation 14. When the fruit is brought forth, immediately he put it in the sickle because the harvest is come. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church when the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. A Christ object lesson, page 68 and 69. Now, to repeat again, that statement, he put it into the sequel because the harvest is come. We know that that is found in Revelation 14. So let us read Revelation 14, verse 14. And I look and behold a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, 
and in his hand a sharp sickle. Revelation 14, verse 14. And in track number 3, track number 3, page 48, it says, This coming of the Son of Man is plainly, therefore, not when the resurrected and the living righteous are caught up together to meet him in the air. For verses 17 to 20, following the ones quoted in the paragraph above, so that is pointing to Revelation 14, verse 14 to 16, revealed that after he came and ripped the earth, another angel, having a sharp sickle, came and ripped a second harvest before the wrath of God. The seven last plagues was poured out upon the wicked. And the quotation is Revelation 15 verse 1. Thus again and for the fourth time, it is seen that there are two different comings of the Son of Man. The one to severe the wicked from among the just in the church, Matthew 13, 49. And then immediately to call the just from among the wicked in Babylon, Revelation 18, 4. The other to take the saints, both the resurrected and the living, to the mansions which he has prepared for them. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, John 14, verse 1 to 3. But I would like to focus our attention to the coming of the Son of Man in Revelation 14, verse 14. In 2 TG, uh, 2 TG number uh, 44, on page 37, it says, Who gathers the first fruits? If the first fruits gather the second fruits, then it says, let us find our answer by reading Revelation 14, 14 to 19. I will no longer read Revelation 14, 14 to 19. It says, here we are again told that there are two reapings, one by the Son of Man and another by an angel. The reaping by the Son of Man precedes the reaping by the angel. The Son of Man, therefore, gathers the first fruits. So it is the Son of Man that gathers the first fruit, or the Son of Man himself obviously reaps the first fruits. 2 TG 44, page 37. But in Christ's object lesson, page 68 and page 69, that coming of Jesus Christ to harvest the 144,000 living saints is at the time by which there is a church on earth that Jesus Christ claimed them as his own. But the absolute fact is that, according to Answerer number 2, page 88, he acquires ownership of it while Jesus Christ was still in the heavenly sanctuary. So, when Jesus Christ arrived to the earth, that is the material side by which Jesus Christ claimed them that such movement is his own movement. Now, without any doubts, it could not be the movement in Luke 19, but rather it is the movement in the parable of Matthew 25 because number three indicates the trinity in the church. Now, I would like to read uh, this reading. In 1934, track 3, 1934 edition, it says here on page 68, As our world is about 6,000 years old, then in order to prove that the 40 days of his presence with the disciples were symbolical of his being the savior of the entire world under sin, we must multiply the number of his name, 3, with the sim symbolical time 40 of gathering his people which gives the equation 40 times 3 equals 120 the number here derived being the exact number of the first fruits on the day of pentecost proves that the little group was the product of the true church the effort of the father son and the holy ghost hence as number three is symbolical of the trinity the number 120 is symbolical of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and Saints, Pentecost. So that is very plain, uh, brothers and sisters. The, the number 120 is symbolical of Father, God the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and Saints. And it says that is symbolized by Pentecost. And number 3 
signify the Trinity in the church by which the shepherd's rod called it the true church. So the Trinity in the church, that is the only true church. The same in track number 8, right? On page 30, it says, And number 3, for the Trinity in the church. Track number 8, page 30. Now, let us read 2SR. 236 and 237. So let us read. There are only five calls in the parable. First, those who were called early Israel out of Egypt. Second, those who went to labor in the vineyard at the third hour, the early Christian church. Third, the six-hour call, William Miller and his co-workers. Fourth, The ninth hour call, the third angel in his first cry after 1844. Then fifth, the eleventh hour call, the loud cry of the third angel's message. As number seven is used in every one of God's finished acts to denote completeness, there must have been two such calls before Israel's time. Otherwise, it would show incompleteness in the proclamation of the gospel. And Enoch, also the seventh from Adam, prophesied of this, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints, Jude verse 14. Then he says, As Enoch had a worldwide message of the coming of the Lord, his message is the first call. Noah's call is the second from creation. Therefore, seven in all, seven in all meaning perfect. Finish the end of the gospel. So this paragraph plainly telling you and I that there are seven universal messages. And the next paragraph is seven universal movements. Now let us read. Thus far, we have referred to the calls only, but now we turn our attention to the movements The start of the first movement is from the time Adam sinned to Enoch message. Second, from Enoch to Noah. Third, from Noah to Moses. Fourth, from Moses to the apostles. Fifth, from the apostles to Miller. Sixth, from Miller to Ellen G. White. Seventh, from Ellen G. White to the end. From the last call to the end, being only one hour, it proves that there is no time for a new movement. And a new movement would throw the number seven out of its significance. Therefore, the old movement must be purified and marched on. Now, let us analyze closely the statement here in 2SR 236 and 237. Now, to help us understand, let us enumerate one by one. So, first, I would like to enumerate seven universal movements. So, seven universal movements. Then one, two, three, four, five, six, and six, then seven. So, the first one is Adamic movement according to the shepherd's word. The second one is the Enosians. The third one is the Noasians. The fourth one is the Mosaic movement. The fifth one is the Apostolic. The sixth is the Millerites movement. Then the seventh is the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So in this enumeration, according to the Shepherd's Rod, the eleventh-hour movement cannot be a universal movement. Otherwise, it would throw out the number seven, which is completeness. So to repeat again, it was predicted beforehand that the eleventh-hour movement cannot be a universal movement because there is time no longer. So the statement, there will be no more new movement pointing to universal movement. The last universal movement is the Seventh-day Adventist Church. There are many universal movements besides the Seventh-day Adventist Church, but they are not recognized by God as His. We are only talking about the seven universal movements recognized by God as His movement. And the last universal movement is the Seventh-day Adventist Church. 
the 11 hour movement cannot be a universal movement. Otherwise, it would throw out the number 7. Now, how about the 7 universal messages? The one we read in the upper paragraph. 7 universal messages. What are those 7 universal messages? The shepherds says the first universal message is the message of Enoch. The second is the message of Noah. The third is the message of Moses. The fourth is the message of the apostles. And the fifth is the message of Miller. Of course, the last one is the 11th hour message. The 11th hour message. Now, who bear the number six? The universal message. Is it the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Now, let us read the statement given by the shepherds. Right? First, let us read uh, 2TG. Uh, 2TG number 15, page 6. It says, After the disappointment, they were commanded to prophesy again. That is, again to proclaim the cleansing of the sanctuary. This work they were to do among many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. Obviously, not to all. Thus, it was that the first Advent movement was reorganized and renamed Seventh-day Adventists. The Seventh-day Adventist organization, therefore, will not finish the work. Its message does not go to all people, to all nations, tongues, and kings. Now, here's another statement in White House Recruiter. On page 23, it says, let us read 22 and 23. The next decisive point of truth is that the judgment of the dead was to be proclaimed to many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Revelation 10 verse 11. Mark the word many, it never means all and never means every. Since this verse of scripture foretells the expansion of the Nent our group and message, it will highly repay each one carefully. To examine what Revelation 10 verse 11 says on the subject, you dare not add to the word nor subtract from it, then compare it with the scriptures to follow. Foretailing the expansion of the 11th hour group and message, and you will have the whole truth in reference to the finishing of the work. Now that the time has finally come for the Lord to recruit His 11th hour servants, this priceless parable is unfolded and for the first time it is plainly seen that whereas the judgment of the dead was to be proclaimed to many nations and people, the judgment of the living is to be proclaimed to all nations and to every people on earth. Here is what inspiration itself says. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Revelation 14, verse 6 and 7. I think those two passages is sufficient enough to establish the absolute fact that the message that was entrusted by God to the servant, the Adventist church, which is the judgment that pertains to the dead. It is not a universal message. And the only message by which the expansion is worldwide is the 11th hour message. Therefore, we can easily understand because there is no other uh, group of people under the sun that proclaim the message that pertains to the judgment of the living except the this day organization then we can easily understand that the six universal messages is the message that had been proclaimed by the DSDA organization. But this number six is even more pertaining to the seven antitypical brothers of David. So the 11th hour is the eight church that is antitypical David. So here we can easily discern that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is a worldwide organization, a universal movement. But their message is not universal. But here, supposed to be, I would like to say supposed to be, the this day organization, more particularly to the seven antitypical brothers of David, their message is universal, but not the movement. 
the mere fact that the message of the Seventh-day Adventist Church became universal while the Bible is more prophecy declared clearly, more particularly to the shepherds rod, that the message that was entrusted to the Seventh-day Adventist Church is not universal, indicates apostasy. It is no longer the message that was entrusted by God to the Seventh-day Adventist Church that they were proclaiming. Because if the message that was entrusted to them is the message that they were proclaiming, their message will never become universal. But the fact that their message became universal indicates apostasy. For example, the third angel's message in its primary phase, judgment that pertains to the dead. Look at what happened to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Violating the fourth commandment, cooking food during Sabbath, and eating flesh food. They completely abandoned the health reform. Supposed to be all Seventh-day Adventists throughout the whole world must be a vegetarian. So to repeat again, the only reason why the message of the Seventh-day Adventist Church became universal because that is the strongest proof that there is apostasy. That the message that they were proclaiming throughout the whole world is no longer the message that was entrusted by God unto them because if the message that was entrusted to them, they remain faithful, that is the only message that they will proclaim throughout the whole world, their message will never become universal because God cannot be mistaken. And the mere fact that the Bijan today, their movement is universal, indicates that that is not the 11th hour movement. But rather, they were fulfill, fulfilling Luke 19 verse 14 because the citizens mentioned here are universal movement. And brothers and sisters, in reality, Luke 19 14 cannot be applied to the Seventh-day Adventist Church because that group of people, according to the shepherd's rod, they believe the premillennial kingdom. They believe that there is a premillennial kingdom. But the only objection is that they don't want that man to reign over them. And it cannot be applied in the Seventh-day Adventist Church because the Seventh-day Adventist Church don't believe a premillennial kingdom. Now, let us continue to our subject. The shepherd's rod is very plain in track number 6. That the coming mentioned in Luke 19 is second coming. Now let us read again. Track number 6, page 55. The scriptures make clear that while in the sanctuary Christ receives the kingdom after the thrones are cast down. It did not say after the thrones were cast down but inscribed in present occurrence. Now, let us read again, track number 6, page 55 and page 56. The scriptures make clear that while in the sanctuary, meaning while Jesus Christ was still in the sanctuary, Christ receives the kingdom. After the thrones are cast down. Now, where does the thrones are cast down? For sure, it cannot be in October 22, 1844. Because for that long years, brothers and sisters, we could no longer apply the grammatical rule saying the thrones are cast down. And after the investigative judgment is completed and cannot be in October 22, 1844, how could it be that the judgment is completed while that is only commencing? After the thrones are cast down, so let uh, us enumerate by one by one and try to establish this absolute fact by uh, placing some questions. So, when does Jesus Christ receive the kingdom? The answer is first, while Jesus Christ is still in the sanctuary. So, of course, that is heavenly sanctuary. So, to repeat again, when does Jesus Christ receive the kingdom? While Jesus Christ was still in the sanctuary. Second, after the thrones are cast down. And third, after the investigative judgment is completed. And fourth, before his second coming. 
So, I would like to repeat again. There are four pertinent facts. Now, let's now establish. When does Jesus Christ receives the kingdom? So, that is the question. When does Jesus Christ receives the kingdom? Number one, while Jesus Christ was still in the heavenly sanctuary. Number two, after the thrones are cast down. Number three, after the investigative judgment is completed. And number four, before His second coming. So let us now ascertain clearly these four pertinent facts. Number one, what apartment of the sanctuary? Is it holy place or is it most holy place? Number two, what place does the thrones are cast down? Number three, what investigative judgment which is completed? Is it the investigative judgment in the holy place? Or is it the investigative judgment in the most holy place? Number four, what coming? Is it Christ coming to the earth? Or Christ coming to the heavenly sanctuary? So, now, first let us go first to investigative judgment. If that investigative judgment is in the most holy place, the investigative judgment in the most holy place will be completed, brothers and sisters, at the general close of provision. Or, in other words, at the moment when the investigative judgment in the most holy place is completed, all the judicial tribunal will vacate the heavenly sanctuary, and then the seven last plagues, literal plagues, are poured out. Therefore, it cannot be applied to that investigative judgment because that coming in Luke 19 is Christ coming to the earth to slay the enemies of God, which is in the church, not in the world. Then there is no escaping the conclusion that such investigative judgment mentioned is in the holy place, by which the great multitude will no longer pass the investigation in the holy place. Because the only investigation in the holy place is blotting out of names. And during the period of the great multitude, according to track number 5, page 110, it says, let us read, the court, in other words, is symbolical of the immeasurable innumerable harvest of second fruits brought in after the measurable, numerable harvest of first fruits, the 144,000. It is not measured, meaning investigated, because it represents those among whom there are no bad to be cast out, for they are gathered in after the cleansing of the heavenly temple. That is very plain. After the cleansing of the heavenly temple. And the only cleansing on the heavenly temple are book works. According to track number 3, page 50 and 51. As the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary is a work of cleansing the books. By blotting from them the names of both the backsliders and the tails. Track number 3, page 50 and page 51. So the only cleansing that pertains into the heavenly sanctuary is the cleansing of the books by blotting out the names of the wicked. And to repeat again, that work cannot be performed in the most holy place because according to 2SR 184, it says, The virgins were called to meet him and thus by faith go in with him to appear before the Father, the great judge. The seal is the permit. It places their names in the Lamb's book of life. And thus it grants to them the right to appear before the Father in the judgment, not in person, but in figure, thus having their sins blotted out. Now, if that books to be cleansed are already in the most holy place, 
then it is illogical to say that the only names to be brought into the most holy place are those names that receive the seal of the living God. The seal is their permit that they could enter into the most holy place. It grants them to appear before their father in the judgment in the most holy place. While in reality, the names of the wicked, which is recorded into that book, Lamb's Book of Life, were already in the most holy place. That is impalpable inconsistency. Therefore, we can easily understand that the Lamb's Book of Life, by which it is mixed with the names of the wicked and the righteous, is located in the holy place. And the only names to be brought into the presence of God the Father are those names that had been left in the Lamb's Book of Life and it was transcribed to the book, Lamb's Book of Life, sealed with seven seals. And that book is the only book to be brought into the presence of God the Father, by which, according to 2SR 199, only the names of the righteous will be inscribed into that book, the Lamb's Book of Life, sealed with seven seals. 2SR page 100. 99 saying the book containing the names of all the righteous beginning with Adam and on to the close of provision, the end of the gospel, seven seals. 2 SR page 199. Now let us go back again to our reading in track number 6, page 55. When does Jesus Christ receive the kingdom? He says, after the investigative judgment is completed. He did not say, after the investigative judgment was completed. But rather, presently finished. Just finished. Not after it was finished. So, the statement, Jesus Christ receives the kingdom after the investigative judgment is completed, pointing to the investigative judgment in the holy place, which is the blotting out of names, by which such blotting out of names will be performed on the day of atonement. Therefore, the statement, Jesus Christ receives the kingdom after the investigative judgment is completed, can be easily understood by saying that Jesus Christ receives the kingdom, acquires ownership of it at the moment when all the names of the wicked in the Lamb's Book of Life among the congregation of the living under the seven seal is completely blotted out. In that very moment, Jesus Christ receives the kingdom. So that is very plain, uh, brothers and sisters. What does it mean by receives the kingdom? Acquires ownership of it. Now let us read first, track number 3, uh, pages 73 and 74. Being the day of atonement in type for both the dead and the living, this service of the earthly tabernacle therefore projects the day of atonement in its antitype. The cleansing of the sanctuary in heaven from unworthy names in the books and the cleansing of the church on earth from its unconverted and unstable members thus bringing the time of clean books, clean church, and clean people. So after or at the moment when all the names of the wicked under the congregation among the living were completely blotted out, at that moment, then the books are cleansed. And at the moment when the books are cleansed, Jesus Christ receives the kingdom. What kingdom? The kingdom church. Who are they? The 144,000. He acquires ownership of the 144,000 and that is the reason that Jesus Christ is pleading with God the Father saying, my blood, my blood, my blood, Father. Now before going to that uh, vision of Sister White, let us read first 
be consecrated way to Christian perfection. So let us read. Consecrated way to Christian perfection. It says here, 113, the cleansing of the sanctuary. So it says here, the cleansing of the sanctuary and the finishing of the mystery of God are identical as to time. Now, brothers and sisters, what does it mean by the word identical? Let us define first in a dictionary. The word identical is an adjective and it says similar, alike. So, for example, if you will say identical twins, meaning both of them are male or both of them are female. That's what it means by the word identical, equivalent, parallel. And the word parallel meaning equidistant or the distant is equal. Now, let us read again the statement here. In Consecrated Way to Christian Perfection, page 113. The cleansing of the sanctuary and the finishing of the mystery of God are identical as to time and are also so closely related as to be practically identical in character and event. Then it says, The finishing of this work of the sanctuary and for the sanctuary was, likewise, the finishing of the work for the people. For in that day of the cleansing of the sanctuary, which was the day of atonement, whosoever of the people did not by searching of heart, confession and putting away of sin, take part in the service of the cleansing of the sanctuary, was cut off forever. Thus the cleansing of the sanctuary extended to the people and included the people as truly as it did the sanctuary itself. And whosoever of the people was not included in the cleansing of the sanctuary and was not himself cleansed equally with the sanctuary from all iniquity and transgression and sin was cut off forever. And say Leviticus 16 verse 15 to 19 and 29 to 34 and Leviticus 23 verse 27 to verse 32. Consecrated Way to Christian Perfection, page 113. Now, remember, the shepherd's rod declared clearly here in White House Recruiter, page 21. It says, And that anyone who then, during the antitypical day of atonement for the dead, should be found among the dead with his sins unconfessed, his soul not afflicted, and without the wedding garment on, would be cut off from among his people. Matthew 22 verse 11 to 13 and Leviticus 23 verse 29. Although it is pertaining to the dead, but it is even more definitely applied to the living, that those who will not afflict his soul, they will be cut off forever. Now, I would like to read 1SR page 100. 77 it says that is after the separation purification those who are left the hundred forty four thousand being the remnant the affliction is the time of purification so when does the time of affliction that is the time of the purification of the church and the purification of the church is also called the cleansing of the sanctuary by which that event is identical to God's people on the earth. Now let's go back to our subject. We already proven with the absolute fact that accordingly Jesus Christ acquires ownership of it while Jesus Christ was still in the heavenly sanctuary. While Jesus Christ was still on the heavenly sanctuary. But the question is, what apartment? That he acquires ownership of it without any doubt. That is pointing to the apartment in the holy place. Because that investigative judgment which is completed cannot be in the most holy place. Otherwise, we will be saying that at the time when the investigative judgment in the most holy place is completed, that is the time that Jesus Christ acknowledged a church on earth as his own. By which at that time, that is the general clause of provision. Contrary, contradictory to all the prophetic events. So let us now 
um, try to elaborate that statement in track number 6, page 55. First, immediately after all the names of the wicked among the congregation of the living, the investigative judgment is completed. Then Jesus Christ acquires ownership of those names that had been left written in the Lamb's Book of Life that they are all as His. And it was proven in the vision of Sister White in early writings, page 38. It says, I saw four angels who had a work to do on the earth and were on their way to accomplish it. Jesus was clothed with priestly garments. He gazed in pity on the remnant, then raised his hands and with a voice of deep pity cried, My blood, Father, my blood, my blood, my blood. So this pleading of Jesus Christ, he acquires ownership of those names that had been left written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And he pleaded with God the Father. Now let us continue reading. Then I saw an exceeding bright light come from God who sat upon the great white throne and was shed all about Jesus. Now it answers the question, where is that place by which the throne were cast down? That is on the great white throne. And that is the reason why I would like to read. To TG number 12 on page 29. It says, The revelation moreover in the following verses again and again endeavors to make us see that the event there portrayed is the judgment in session. And the quotation is Revelation 14 verse 7. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. But it was attached. Revelation 20 verse 4. Revelation 20 verse 4 is pointing to the great white throne. And I saw thrones, John declares, and judgment was given unto them. Now, let us read track number 15, page 23, so that we could understand. Concerning that great white throne, Revelation 20 verse 4, it says, the one we read in 2 TG 12:29. Track 15, page 23. Moreover, as there is but one judicial sitting during the millennium, the thrones of verse 4 must be in session jointly with the great white throne. So what is Revelation 20, verse 4? It says that is connect to the great white throne. Furthermore, it is not likely that the great white throne would be in session all by itself. Here we can easily see that the great white throne recorded in Revelation 20 verse 4. We know that the great white throne is found on Revelation 20 verse 11. Right? That is in Revelation 20 verse 11. And the shepherds are declared clearly here in tract 15 page 23 that it is during the millennium 1,000 years during the millennium when the earth became the bottomless pit. Now let us read track number, track number 5 on page 60. It says, Since the bottomless pit of Revelation 20 verse 3 is symbolical of the earth as a prison house during the millennium, then the bottomless pit of Revelation 9 verse 1 being identical must likewise be symbolical of the earth as a prison house at another time. The shepherd's rod is very plain that Revelation 9 verse 1, that bottomless pit is the symbolical earth or symbolical of the earth. And we always emphasize this in Track number 5, page 26, the question, symbolical or literal? Which? And the Sherperson says that only when this question is positively answered, that we could be able to understand this prophecy. And in track number 5, page 41, it says, For if every term are not symbolical, then how should we differentiate those which are and those which are not? And how shall we be able to define the truth? 
Therefore, Revelation 9 verse 1, being a part of the trumpet study, the fifth trumpet, the perfect fulfillment must be pointing to the symbolical earth. By which such symbolical earth became the bottomless pit. <laughs> what does it mean, became the bottomless pit? Now let us read page 61 in track number 5. He says, The very fact that God's people are visited with the power to keep open the bottomless pit, then should they be defeated, the pit would be shut and would become a prison house from which there would be no escape unless it be reopened. Track number 5, page 61. If God's people will be defeated, what happened to the bottomless pit? It will be shut and there is no escape unless it will be reopened. Now, in the subject of um, the beast study, 2SR page 97, let's read, 2SR page 97, it says, By the divinely called movement and aided by the writings of the spirit prophecy, God's intention was to keep the deadly one on the head. But the prophetic word of God says his deadly wound was healed. Since God's holy word declares that the wound was healed, and as the prophecy cannot be broken, it is positive that the wound is healed. But if Protestantism by obedience to God's word is what inflicted the wound, then true Protestantism only can keep the painful sore on the head. If the wound is healed, then it is evident that they to whom God had committed the message for a perishing word had been defeated in the same manner as every movement since the world began. That is very plain. But the most startling revelation is that in the last period of the exceeding great horn, it is not only the sanctuary itself that had been trodden underfoot, but the place itself. That is very plain in track number 4, page 26. What does it mean? By trodden underfoot. In the parable of Jesus Christ in Matthew 5, verse 13, taken for granted. Christ's mediatorial work in the heavenly sanctuary became obscured. According to track number 4, page 26, note that the truth and the place, not the sanctuary itself, were cast down. That is, both Christ's truth and his place. What is the truth? The daily and the sanctuary. And what is the place? That is the vineyard. The vineyard became the dragon's headquarters. He says, and his place in the early sanctuary were set aside, so that the knowledge as to his mediatorial work became obscured. I will no longer elaborate that portion because we studied that several times. But I would like to emphasize now the momentous event that soon, very soon, will be fulfilled. Brothers and sisters, now the word identical meaning uh, similar or parallel. But for sure, uh, brothers and sisters, the, the bottomless pit um, during millennium, we know that that is 1,000 years. The earth became bottomless pit by which at that time all the wicked human beings were dead and only the fallen angels together with Lucifer were on this earth. But the bottomless pit in Revelation 9 verse 1 pointing to the symbolical earth indicates that it was predicted beforehand that the symbolical earth the horn shall be ruled all over the earth. To SR 139. When? On the brass kingdom. Is it Grisia? No. Brass has a numerical value of number 3. Track number 2, page 13. So, indicates that it is on the third period because the exceeding great horn is divided into three periods. Pagan. Ecclesiastical and Protestant, track number 3, page 39. And it was predicted beforehand that in the Protestant period, the vineyard which is Palestine, track number 12, page 43, by which the modern Palestine is the United States of America, 1SR, page 158, had been completely defeated by the devil, that the entire two-horned beast domain Brothers and sisters, we are in total darkness concerning the proceeding in the heavenly sanctuary. Even in the very moment 
by which the judgment for the living is in progress, they have no knowledge at all. By which, before Jesus Christ begin the proceedings of the judgment for the living on earth, Jesus Christ first came to this earth and give message to Ezekiel by which it was illustrated that the message that was given to Ezekiel is the Bible. That is the Bible. So, the Bible and the vision of Ezekiel was illustrated into the book that Ezekiel ate. According to track number 1, page 29 and page 30. Remember, whatever the message that have been given by God to Ezekiel, it is mandatory that such message must be only to the 12 tribes. Track number 1, page 14. To the 144,000 living saints. And since we are studying who trumpets, who unto them that keep the 144,000 in bandage? Where? In the bottomless pit. According to answerer number 4, Page 22 and page 23, let's read again the statement concerning Isaiah 63, verse 3. The first part of the verse applies to the first advent of Christ and the last part to the time of the purification of the church. That whoever continues to hold his people, that is the 144,000, in bandage and in ignorance of his truth, will he tread in his anger and trample them in his fury, and sprinkled their blood upon his garments, thereby staining all his raiment, and thus setting his people free. Answerer number 4, page 22, page 23. You cannot uh, hide the truth. You cannot hinder the truth. And you cannot keep God's people in bondage forever. And woe unto them that keeping God's people in bondage Brothers and sisters, now let us go back to the vision that was shown by God to uh, Sister White. Now to repeat again, the great white throne during millennium, that is 1000 years, and let us distinctly separate the great white throne that will be fulfilled, brothers and sisters, after the investigative judgment in the holy place is completed. That is no longer 1000 years years but 1,000 days. Both of them are 1,000. But the difference between the one and the other is that God the Father sits on the great wine throne at the commencement of the 1,000 years by which the earth, the literal earth, became the bottomless pit. Whereas in Revelation 20 verse 4 quoted in 2 TG 12 29, God the Father sits on the great wine throne at the end of the 1,000 days, by which that is the limited period of time that those who continue God's people in bondage even after, at the end of the 1,000 days, they will suffer such punishment. Now, let us read again, early writings, page 38. It says, I saw my accompanying angel the meaning of what I heard and what the four angels were about to do. He said to me that it was God that restrained the powers and that he gave his angels charge over things on the earth. That the four angels had power from God to hold the four winds and that they were about to let them go. But while their hands were loosening and the four winds were about to blow, the merciful eye of Jesus gazed on the remnant that were not sealed. We explain it several times that the term remnant indicates the one that are left after the separation, after the removal, or after the destruction. 1 SR 102. But the term remnant here cannot be destruction, but rather they became remnant after the removal of all the names of the wicked recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life in the heavenly sanctuary, as explained by the shepherd's rod in 1 TG number 6, page 38, saying, Only the holy ones, those whose names are left written in the book, so that is 
the remnant. Only the holy ones, whose, those whose names are left written in the book, escape the destruction that falls upon the wicked in the church. Only they constitute the remnant, the ones that are left. Why is it that they are called remnant? Because they were the only ones that had been left written in the Lamb's book of life. After all the names of the wicked among the congregation of the living under the seventh seal were completely blotted out. And that is the 144,000. It says here in 1TG number 11, page 11, So only those who survived the judgment for the living in the house of God, First Peter 4 verse 17, those whose names are not blotted out from the book, Revelation 3 verse 5, will comprise the church among whom are to be 144,000 sons of Jacob. Revelation 7 verse 3 to 8. And when Michael stands up, then those whose names are left in the book will be delivered from the trouble such as never was. Daniel 12 verse 1. Now, let's go back again to the vision of Sister White in her writings, page 38. It says, The merciful eye of Jesus gazed on the remnant that were not sealed, and he raised his hands to the Father and pleaded with him that he had spilled his blood for them. So, these names that had been left written in the Lamb's book of life, Jesus Christ acquires ownership. Jesus Christ claimed them as his own by saying that I have spilled my blood for them. And where is that place that Jesus Christ is pleading? It is found in the upper paragraph. That Jesus Christ is pleading, it says, Then I saw an exceeding bright lamp come from God who sat upon the great white throne and was shed all about Jesus. And that great white throne is not in the sanctuary that is in the palace grounds that is in Mount Zion. Now, so that what it means by standing on Mount Zion figuratively, bringing our names in the presence of God the Father on the great white throne, if we will be among the 144,000 living saints. Now, let us now go back to track number 6, page 55. When does Jesus Christ receive the kingdom? To repeat again, the kingdom mentioned there is pointing to the kingdom church, the 144,000 living saints. It is after the investigative judgment is completed. What investigative judgment? Investigative judgment in the holy place. Meaning, after all the names of the wicked had been completely blotted out among the congregation of the living, and there are no other names that had been left among the congregation of the living under the seventh seal, except the 144,000 living saints, and those names that had been left, Jesus Christ acquires ownership of it. Then we can easily understand that the second coming mentioned in track number 6, page 55, is Christ's second coming to the most holy place. The fulfillment of 2SR, 2SR 241. Therefore, the prophecy by Enoch commenced its fulfillment in 1844, at which time the Lord came with the names and records of those who are sleeping in the grave. And when the investigation of the dead is finished, then he comes with the names of the living saints, first with the 144,000. So that is very plain. Jesus Christ bringing the names of the 144,000. But since at that time, God the Father is no longer in the most holy place, but sitting on the great white throne, therefore Jesus Christ enter to the most holy place, down to the place where God the Father is sitting. Therefore, the thrones that had been cast down are the thrones on Mount Zion. 
Now let's read 2SR. 2SR page 170 and 171. Chapter 14 verse 1. And I looked and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. The lamb denotes Christ, signifying the position he occupies before the close of provision, while yet interceding for his people. But we know that the interceding here is found in the vision of Sister White on the early writings, page 38. He pleaded God the Father to hold the four wings first and to let the four angels bearing slaughtering weapons in their hands to stand by. Because he acquires ownership of those names that had been left written in the Lamb's book of life. And he emphasizes saying, my blood, Father, my blood, my blood. I had spilled my blood for them. Or in other words, the particular object in view is the time when the sanctuary in the heavenly sanctuary is completely cleansed. The particular object in view, they are the saints that will no longer to taste death. Now it says here, let's read again. The lamp denote, denotes Christ signifying the position he occupies before the close of provision. While yet interceding for his people. Therefore, the specific number of saints stand with him on earth while he is yet in the Mount Zion place. Mount Zion in old Jerusalem was an ancient spot of the city and the place of the real residence of David and his successors. Therefore, from that viewpoint, we must present the meaning of the Lamb that stood on the Mount Zion. We are told by the following scriptures, the Lord had made a promise that the house of David, Mount Zion, was alive to him and to his sons forever. So that is very plain, brothers and sisters. And it says, how be the Lord would not destroy the house of David because of the covenant that he had made with David. And as he promised to give a light to him and to his sons forever. 2 Chronicles 21 verse 7 The promise was not to Mount Zion, house of David. In ancient Jerusalem, for the existence of the Jewish nation was conditional. Therefore, when that house of David will be in existence, the existence of that house of David is no longer conditional. What does it mean by conditional? Meaning it can be easily understood that when the house of David will be in existence, there is no more prophecy that that ministry, that that church would be apostatized. It is very important, brothers and sisters, because we know that accordingly, um, in 1 TG, I would like to read, 1 TG number 18, on page 14, it says, Thus one event is contingent upon another one following the other, the last of which in this chapter is the great morning in Jerusalem. In the day of this event of mourning, therefore the fountain for, the, for sin and for uncleanness is opened. Let us now connect Zechariah 13 verse 1 with verse 2. In that day, Zechariah 13 verse 1 and 2, in that day, in the day the great morning takes place, there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land, and they shall no more be remembered. And also I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. Then this is the commentary given by the Shepherds Rod. 1 TG number 18, page 14. Two things now stand out clearly in these verses. Number one, that the house of David must come into existence before the cleansing fountain is open. So that is very definite that the house of David must come into existence before the cleansing fountain is open. And when that house of David will be in existence, it is no longer conditional because God's promise, it says that when that house of David will be in sixth existence, the covenant that had been promised by God will be fulfilled unto them. 
forever. Second, that the cleansing begins with cutting off the names of the idols. Now, in what way by which the names of the idols will be cut off? It is pointing to the occurrence in the heavenly sanctuary. And it says, I'm throwing out of the land the false prophets and the unclean spirits. The false prophets mentioned here, without any doubt, they are the prophets of Baal. Now, let us go back to 2SR 171. It says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He said not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ, the son of David. Galatians chapter 3 verse 16. Therefore, Mount Zion, as in Revelation 14 verse 1, is the imminent royal spot in the heavenly Jerusalem. As David himself says, For there are set thrones of judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Psalms 122 verse 5. So the thrones mentioned in track number 6 must be the thrones of judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Where is that place? Mount Zion, according to the reading. Then it says, David looked forward to the time when the judgment on, in heaven would be set up. In that day, there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. To us are page 170 and 171. So, to repeat again, brothers and sisters, I would like to make a recapitulation to our study. There are two parables, Luke 19 and Matthew 25. And there is a very significant difference between the two parables according to track number 8, page 29 and page 30. The parable in Matthew 25 represents the true church. Because number three represents the trinity in the church. Track number eight, page 30. And number three indicates local application. And that is the 11th hour church. Because the 11th hour church is not a universal movement. Therefore, if the movement you belong is a universal movement, that cannot be the 11th hour church. But rather... They must be belong to that ministry because servants represent ministry. 1 TG 39 page 8. And 10 servants indicates universality worldwide. By which the Bible says they are the enemies of Jesus Christ. Luke 19 verse 27. Why? Because they were the very ones who hindered the message. They were the very ones who speak evil against the message. They were the very ones that keeping God's people in bondage. Not forever. And that time is no longer far distant, brothers and sisters. When the boundary line will finally arrive. That is the time when Jesus Christ will come. And that is the fulfillment of Malachi 3 verses 1 to 3. Now let us read to SR page 184. It says here, The description by Daniel applies to the commencement of the judgment for the dead. But the one by Malachi 3 verse 1 to 3 is applicable to the judgment for the living. All of the same event, day of atonement, cleansing of the sanctuary. So, that is very plain, brothers and sisters. Now, I would like to read Symbolic code 6 and 7, page 5. But I would like to, to begin on page, page 4. It says here, it is concerning Matthew 3, verse 11 and 12. Although we'll discuss it in the next episode. It says, since those persons whom John baptized, and even many that were baptized later, are now dead. Now, this statement, let us apply to also to B.T. Hotep. All of them are now dead. They will not meet the Lord except they be resurrected. Which fact causes us to understand that they were baptized for the resurrection. So, Bidhotep was among them that had been baptized for the resurrection. 
they were baptized for the purpose for the resurrection according to this reading and then it says in other words had they not performed their duty of baptism they would not rise in the first resurrection nor would they enter the kingdom of god we must bear in mind however that the judgment precedes the resurrection it says the judgment must precedes the resurrection what's judgment of course it must be definitely applied only to the holy place because the the, the, the judgment in the most holy place brothers and sisters was still in progress even after Daniel 12:2 and Ezekiel 37 were resurrected then it says then prior to the resurrection their cases are taken up in the judgment and the decision is made which determines that they are worthy to be called forth in the resurrection of the just after their resurrection they will meet the lord and will receive welcome into his kingdom their baptism then was for the resurrection of the righteous dead while john was preaching baptism with water he said in matthew 3 verse 11 and 12 i indeed baptize you with water unto repentance but he that cometh after me is mightier than i whose shoes i am not worthy to bear he shall baptize you with the holy ghost and with fire whose spend is in his hand and he will thoroughly and he will truly forge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire who are they the wheat let's read 1 sr 228 He says the wheat represents the 144,000. Who will gather the 144,000? Jesus Christ. So that is the fulfillment in Matthew 3 verse 11 and 12. Then it says page 5, two symbolic code number 6 and 7 page 5. Jesus who was to follow after John was to baptize with the Holy Ghost and with fire. But the fact is that when he came he to baptize with water. just as John did therefore we must conclude that the baptism of which John spoke is still future if it is when will it come to pass that is the question before us now for the answer let us read again in Matthew chapter 3 verse 12 but brethren this subject uh, will continue on our next episode and we will show to you the exact time the appointed time the certain time by which that fulfillment baptism with fire baptism with holy ghost and fire will finally be fulfilled brothers and sisters on our next episode so thank you very much for listening and viewing this program may the good lord bless you and have a beautiful wonderful evening Hello.